So hi, I'm Cynthia Cluck and I'm here with Scott Cassell, who is spokesperson, celebrity spokesperson for Lionfish Central. <laughs> we're proudly sporting the colors today and um, we're outside and it's a little bit chilly and you can see I'm kind of bundled up in my little awesome little hoodie here and you can see that he's not wearing any hood at all and that's because this guy is a super badass. You're not going to believe the resume that you're about to hear, but wow. So. Uh, so Scott, and it's so lengthy that I might not get all of this right. So <laughs> let's see how I do here. So um, first off, you started your early career as commercial diver? Yeah, I was a commercial diver at the age of 15. Youngest commercial diver in the United States at the time. And uh, I mowed lawns and did odd jobs, moving wood piles and stuff to pay for it. And, and uh, played a lot of hooky uh, to do it, but uh, I did it. So you started spending time in the ocean from a young age? Yeah, I was, I was diving since I was six, and uh, I was scuba diving since I was 12. And so I thought when I was 15 years old going through the commercial dive program, I was starting to get old. <laughs> okay, and so then from there, you launched your military career, and you spent 33 years in the military, including Special Forces. And special Operations Community. Uh, I've been blessed to be attached to Special Forces, Rangers, and Scout Platoons. And uh, so the Special Operations Community is home. And I know I can't ask you a whole lot about that, <laughs> um, but we really clearly have our resume list building. And then for an encore of that, you decided to start get in, getting into the ocean and wrestling with giant squid and Humboldt squid. You're actually the first person uh, to have recorded both the Humboldt squid and the giant squid, yes? Well, the giant squid, um, I'm the first one to film Architeuthis ducks in situ, and it was a 54 foot squid. And but the resolution was such that scientists couldn't make a definitive uh, definite you know, what species was it based on the morphology, and uh, they later processed the image through a, a image intensifier and found out oh yeah that's Architeuthis and by then two years had gone by and a uh, scientist had claimed she did it first and she wasn't I did it two years before <laughs> awesome so, yeah. and it's and you're clearly the type of person that it's not about the credit it was about the accomplishment yeah and the, you the way you talk about squid it almost sounds like they're your friends I, they kind of are I, I relate to giant squid better than I do people sometimes <laughs> I, at least you know what they're after you know the, the the giant squid species I mean if you're going to equate them to anything on earth you can say it's earth's resident alien species because I mean imagine this for a minute they've got three hearts they've got ice blue blood they've got more neurons and more pathophysiology of the neurological structure than human beings do times two they have the ability to change color with thought. In other words, it's not going through a central nervous system to change colors of the chromatophores. They're thinking that thought, which lends the question, is it communication? It certainly is, but is it a language? Um, I've actually identified 11 different patterns to behavioral actions that will come sub subsequently. And so you have to ask the questions, were they communicating as a pack of squid and hunting cooperatively? And I think they are, and I've got video evidence that suggests it very strongly. So I'm, I'm kind of a squid nerd. I, I love being around aliens and I just feel right at home. Um, and you've actually gotten the opportunity, you, you have over 15,000 hours of dive time, is that mm -hmm. right? Okay. Yeah, as a commercial diver and as a research diver and a filmmaker, uh, a lot, I've done a lot with National Geographic and, and Discovery Channel, Animal Planet, uh, History Channel. And I tried uh, YouTubing you and like adding up all of the number of different films <laughs> that you've been in. Do you? What? 54, I think. 54, holy yeah. schmoly. <laughs> either, either as the guy who was in front of the camera or holding the camera underwater to get a images of the squid or the whales or the sharks. And um, the more time I spent underwater, the more I started preferring that over crowds of people. You know, at least crowds of people don't explode. And it is probably because the squid are so kind and gentle and welcoming, <laughs> is that right? I've got scars from them. They're definitely not. That's the most aggressive animal. If you're in the water with a Humboldt squid, you're, you're probably not alone. They travel in shoals of up to 500 to 1,000 animals. And so they hunt cooperatively. So if you see one animal, there's hundreds around you. You just don't see them yet, but you will. If they decide to try to feed on you, they'll rush in on you. And the thing about a Humboldt squid, they're not these little, you know, they're not the little Caribbean reef squid. They're, they can be up to 200 pounds. I've filmed them bigger than that. Um, as big around as a 55 gallon drum and 11 times stronger muscle tissue than mammal. So it's a off the charts, insanely aggressive and powerful predator. 
And uh, the only reason I was able to work with it is I learned slowly, after getting hurt a few times, that you have to wear body armor and chain mail and connect it to the boat with the cable. And you just have to be ready to be beat up. I mean, they're just gonna, if they come after you, it's hard. Much more dangerous than a shark. Has, just out of curiosity, has anyone ever told you that you're nuts? <laughs> I seem to get that a lot, actually. But, you know, well, I just love survive? them. How do you survive that? You just make your mindset. I mean, it's it's like, how do you survive anything? You know, you get in a car crash and you're traumatized by it, but how do you survive after that? It's a mindset. You're gonna just deal with it. And when you're looking at an animal that the day before ripped your right arm out of its socket, which the Humboldt squid did do to me, you know, and I'm thinking, how do you get back in the water again after that? Your arm is still sore. It's in a cradle like this. How am I gonna dive with them in a cradle and not get my ass kicked? And the answer was, well, I build myself one of the world's smallest shark cages that fit on a 24 foot punga that we could throw overboard and I crawl inside and this guy I don't even know his name would lower me down to the knot cleat it off and then start fishing squid around me I mean wow yeah, yeah it's not exactly the safest things I've ever done but <laughs> it's not the most unsafe things I've ever done either <laughs> okay and so let I'm gonna gloss over that because clearly you're alluding to things in life that I'm probably not allowed to ask you about uh yeah yeah probably yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh and I wanted to ask about Okay, so you had to design some kind of protection system so that you could survive. I mean, they, yeah. they thrash, right? Like, Well, they grip and they bite. I mean, they have a beak, literally a, a, a 150 pound Humboldt squid, which is not an uncommon size. Uh, the beak is the size of a man's hand. And they, it's like taking two sets of giant shears and putting them together and then cutting. So if it gets a hold of skin and flesh, it's just gonna rifle through an orange sized bite every three seconds and swallow it. So the trick is how to get around that. Well, you have to get around something that won't cut. So the chain mail systems that are made in Canada were the best ones I've ever found. So those are the ones I used. And um, they worked up really well. But then when they slam into you, it's like somebody hitting you with a baseball bat. Well, that's where the wetsuit comes in, but it doesn't help you 100%. So I, I dive with these animals with a mixed gas rebreather on my back for four to six hours. And by the time I was done, I'd get up on the surface. I felt like I got in a full contact fight. I mean, I was bleeding, I was bruised. Sometimes I had dislocations. These, these, these are tough animals to be in the water with, but the payoff was fantastic because the behavioral patterns that I was able to record made me a lot of money, got me on a lot of TV shows, which I'm thankful for, but it also, it gave more information to the scientific base. People in science and in students could see more about the Humboldt squid than they ever could before because I was just, I found them fascinating and I just held the camera and started recording. Tell me about some of the most beautiful places that you've seen underwater. That the rest oh. of us wouldn't be able to just go walk down the street or even buy, buy a plane ticket to and go visit. <laughs> what have you been able to see that the average person can't? Well, I've been a sub-pilot for five different submersibles as a professional and six if you include mine. and. I've been around the world piloting different subs and I've been very blessed to do that. Um, but on the, every time you close that hatch and go down below 200 feet, there's a good chance that you're the first person to ever be there, at least since the last ice age. And uh, if you go down past 300 feet, you're the first person ever. So we're going 300 to 1,000 feet deep with some of the subs that I've been in and we're seeing things unknown to science. And it's very, very exciting because you are literally able to explore just with your eyes your and your cameras are rolling and whatever swims in front of you is either rare or hasn't been seen and i have seen things in the distance and like it's what? One, well <laughs> off catalina island i saw it was 880 feet deep and i saw the water visibility was 100 plus feet it was really nice and pretty i was settling down on the mud and there was this beautiful Gorgonian in front of us that was rare and the scientists wanted us to film it. So we're waiting for the dust to clear. And out of the distance, about 95 feet away, I saw this white fleck moving and my eyes focused and I realized it was a pectoral fin that was at least six feet high. And the body that went by was whale sized. And I'm, well, that's a humpback whale, but why is he here this time of year? And why is it this deep? And then I saw a vertical fin swim by. And so I saw basically a 40 foot shark. Nobody knows what it is. And it was too far away to capture on film. It was right on the edge of visibility. So that was one of the ones that got away. And I so wanted that thing to come back. <laughs> um, but, um, and so, you know, 
all I have is the story. You know, I don't know what it was. All I know, it had a vertical fin and had spots that were as tall as me, and it was awesome. <laughs> so, but I've also really the most beautiful places I've been are in the Channel Islands of California in a kelp forest on my knees looking up mm -hmm. and it is the most beautiful ethereal stained glass window on earth under the kelp forest to see all that light dancing through into this beautiful bright blue water through this green canopy it's uh, it's the most uplifting and spiritual place I've ever been in my life and that's where I pray wow. it's beautiful so I encourage anybody who dives to try to go and see that at least once in your life or google it right now and look at some of the people that have been there for you i think you'll see what i'm talking about okay so let me ask you a question about the lionfish situation yes because you you've shared with us a little bit about the beauty of the oceans and you've certainly seen far more of it than most of us will ever see in our lifetimes well um that may be true and i'm proud of that yeah uh so what's happening with the lionfish the lionfish situation is literally a forest fire, a wildfire spreading underwater that is wiping out all of the coral regions from the tip of South America all the way up to basically, I mean, just, just down the shy of Maine, all of the uh, Atlantic coast of the United States and into the Gulf Coast, off the, off the coast of Florida, all the way up to Texas, and all that area are being inundated by these, these lionfish. And the thing is that the lionfish not only are invasive, they're predators, and they only eat babies. And so they eat small animals. And so they're eating baby octopus, baby game fish, baby shrimp, everything that can fit into their mouth, they'll feed on it. And if I can put that in perspective, every three, I think every four to seven days, something like that, they can breed after they're a year old. And so they breed more than almost any species of fish out there. And, and that I is, it up, it was 30,000 eggs every like three to seven days. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So it, it's insane how many babies that one female can have. And they have taken DNA samples of fish all the way from those, from both coasts, the way I was telling you. And they have found out that all of these probably originated from less than 10 animals that were released illegally or, or accidentally. And so just that many fish have caused this much problem so if we don't focus on that you are literally going to lose all of your wild caught fish and not in a long time i'm not going to give it a date but it's years not decades and so we really need to focus on that if you really and we're finding out that some species of fish are starting to maybe identify them as prey nurse sharks and grouper primarily oh. well the problem is is that People love to eat grouper, so they're the smartest fish that's learning how to eat the lionfish and take care of the problem is being speared or caught and eaten by people. And so we're allowing the lionfish, which will not bite a hook because they eat baby live fish, we're, we're killing out the problem. So if you really like game fish, eat a lionfish. First of all, what do they eat? They eat babies. And the babies don't have as much time um, to ingest and hold mercury in their bodies. So of all the game fish you'll eat, including the lionfish, the lionfish has less mercury than any fish you'll ever eat, high in omega-3s. It is white flaky meat that tastes just like or better than grouper. And I've had it, it's delicious. It's a delicious fish. The problem is a diver has to go down there and spear it to get it because they don't bite hooks. Yeah. And they've had some, su some success in lobster cages and some success with specially built um, traps with uh, Dr. Giddings at NOAA, brilliant man, I, I adore. And uh, he's come up with a good uh, potential solution, but it's only in testing right now. We're, it's not actually harvesting any fish to speak of. And so what we need are people to get a pole spear, go and take a vacation, go spear lionfish and eat them. And if you don't eat them, you can sell them. If you get a $50 uh, spearing license for lionfish, you can wholesale sell them for as much as $7 a pound. So is it possible you can collect enough spear uh, lionfish to pay for your vacation it's not impossible <laughs> i mean there's a fun way of ecotourism so I, uh, I i really encourage people to look at the lionfish seriously because you can't save the coral reefs by putting in corals that you grow putting in fish that you grow by putting in algaes that you grow without the lionfish being removed first it's a waste and there's so much money being pumped into coral restoration that isn't going to take and if it does take the lionfish are going to wipe out a lot of the animals that are there required to take care of the corals and to take care of the algaes. 
And so you can have this overgrowth and the corals are going to suffer and the lionfish should be left. So can I ask you a personal question? Yes, ma'am. Why does this matter so much to you? I mean, it's, <laughs> you're right. It's a huge issue, uh, but you're really dedicating your life to it. And so is Scott Ganello that we heard from earlier. Yeah. Well, the reason I'm doing this is because of Scott Ganello. He taught me. So he's a magnificent source of information and he's the founder of this project that I'm working for and dedicating a large portion of my life to. I brought my submarine from California to here. Now I'm a Florida resident. And the idea is, is that we're gonna take the lionfish submarine, develop it into a spearing system and go down past divers can go. And I'm gonna become the world's first submarine pilot submersible fisherman for lionfish. Interesting title. Um, and, and the reason is, is because it's that important. When I was a kid, I, did, I was abused by two alcoholic parents. And when I was 15 years old, my birthday is my dad gave me a broken jaw. And uh, I had to escape, literally, because I was being beaten pretty good. And I really never went home until the police arrested me and had me go home. And then I just smuggled back out again. So I've been on my own since I was 15. And I did that by That's doing odd jobs. That's why you were a commercial diver when you were Commercial diver at 15. I, I needed to make money. So I thought, oh, yeah, I'm a diver. You know, I love diving. I love the sea. But the point is, is that when I was sad and upset, I went to the ocean. I would bicycle, I'd, I'd take my brother's bicycle without his permission. I'd play hooky and I'd go up all the way over the mountains from where I lived in Palo Alto, all the way down into um, uh, Half Moon Bay. And I would be there at the ocean and the ocean became a substitute mother for me. Wow. So I love the ocean. The ocean's my mom. The ocean's getting her ass kicked. What kind of a son would I be if I just sat by and watched? I can't do it. So she's given me so much. Now it's my time to give something back. And so that's why I'm dedicating the rest of my life to trying to remove the lionfish because of all the things that I've done. I've hunted poachers for po poachers for rhinos, poachers for seals, dolphin, vaquita, uh, totuaba, uh, you know, endangered shark species all around. I've been hunting poachers in five different countries and I would film them. I didn't kill anybody wanted to but I filmed them and I turned that over for prosecution and then they had information they had their names their faces the particular numbers of that the sounds boats. like an easy desk job like you go you fill out some paperwork that's the kind I'm, of job when you say you're hunting poachers I'm a pretty damn good sniper <laughs> oh. <laughs> and I have some experience there and I just utilize as a combat diver which is one of my techniques to get into the combat zone is I, I took that and I used it in as a filmmaker where I'd combat dive right into Cartagena right into um, well, different areas I shouldn't probably name, but and I would climb out of the water at night, set myself up in a blind and a hide, and I'd film people with thermal and night vision while they're doing these atrocities and just being furious watching this. But I can't kill anybody, but so I'm filming them. And I've seen bad people behave badly when they slaughter villagers, but and that burns my blood more. I hate a bully, but when you see people that are doing that to sharks and sea lions and dolphins. You know, it's like, there's nobody crying out for them that's actually doing anything. I'm the only one that I knew that was doing it. They have no voice. They have no voice and they're being slaughtered because people in the political governments there are being bribed and they're letting it happen. And uh, I was trying to shine a light on that infection and let the roaches kind of scatter, you know, in the in the kitchen when you turn the lights on. That's what, that's, these politicians and, and people like that are just like roaches. And you turn the light on, they scatter and... Um, I was just trying to put light on it. And uh, I put a lot of people in prison all around the world doing thank that. Thank you for your service. And thank you for your service there too. <laughs> I'd do it again in a heartbeat. And but thank it, you for your service here. So now you're trying to shine a light on the lionfish situation. Yeah, I truly am. And now we can help. I am so excited about that because really helping the lionfish become eradicated is a healthy thing. And it's not the lionfish's fault. They're beautiful animals that are just doing what they've been evolved to do. They've just been introduced, introduced by man in a place they don't belong. And there's animals that are paying the price left and right. Thousands of animals a day are being killed that we love and cherish. Baby moray eels. I mean, you know, it's possible that they've taken and eaten baby turtles because a baby turtle is just the maximum size that an adult lionfish could eat. So, I mean, is it possible they've affected turtle population? Yeah, it is. And so during hatchlings and, and hatchlings are crawling in the water, I've actually seen a little turtle flying around and then in the background is a lionfish. Why is he there? Why did a lionfish come into the sandy shallows? It makes you wonder. I didn't actually see it, but it makes you wonder. So, Okay, so I hear that we have two options on how to help. 
One is that we can all go become scuba divers and we can learn <laughs> how to go uh, spearfish lionfish and we can pay for our fishing licenses and then maybe we can make a couple bucks if we sell it uh, yes. and we can Absolutely. travel internationally to do all of this and there's a there is a tourism around this right yeah that, there is sky canelo is starting to develop that and you can find that on lionfish central cool uh and look up at the things that he's developing it's it's new and emerging and I, i'm excited about it i really want to see more people doing this because it's out in the beautiful areas of the world you're spearfishing an animal that needs to be taken. You're enjoying nature. You're enjoying your body. You're out there swimming. You're in the sun. Just everything is a win. You that know, it's just awesome. a beautiful thing to do. But we have another way we can help too. Oh, I need a little help. Um, the thing about a submarine is that I've had my submarine here in, in Florida now for about nine months. And it seems like every time we tow the sub, it gets damaged. Somebody, they don't mean to, but I've been run into a bridge. I've been run onto the jetties. I've been run into rocks. I've been grounded. Not a lot of people know how to tow a submarine properly because I draft a little bit more and I'm slow and heavy. Really, the only solution is to crane it up on a small boat, like a 36 to a 42 foot boat, an old commercial lobster boat or a crab boat that I need money buying. I need to buy this old boat. I need to put an A-frame on it and set it up because if I have that, now I can go 30, 60, 80 miles offshore drop the sub in the water, take out lionfish with the spear system that is just coming in in February, and, and hopefully start making a big difference. My goal is to come back with 300 fish a day, because I can stay into water for 10 hours, as deep as 500 feet with the submarine, um, and just keep working, eat my M&Ms, slurp some coffee, shoot a fish, you know, because <laughs> it's really fun, because as the lasers come into view and they cross, that's the actual gauging. So I fire the gun, and it's going to hit with those, those laser dots are on. So I, I have a very effective way of collecting these lionfish. We just have to get it out there in front of the lionfish. And being every time we, every time we get towed out, it costs me thousands of dollars of damage to repair. And I just need a boat to put my sub on. So we need a boat or we can give money. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, because Please. we love money and money loves us. And the reason for that is because we can do great things with money. We can change the world. We can even change the ocean. And yeah, the way or that, save it. or save it, um, the way that I'm choosing to help this is by uh, using my iron, I'm <laughs> superwoman here. <laughs> I'm doing Iron Man Texas in April, and I'm doing that as a fundraiser to help Lionfish Central. So there's a QR code you. that you can go to, and you can donate there, or you can go to lionfishcentral.org and you can donate directly there. Um, just please share this information. I consider myself to be a smart, educated, intelligent, pretty aware person, and I had no idea about any of this until just about three years ago. So a lot of people, smart, intelligent, aware people that you know, really don't know anything at all about this, and they don't know how much needs to be done. They don't know how much progress has already been made, great things are happening, um, and they don't know how easy it is to help. This is an extremely efficient nonprofit. They do great things with the money and mm -hmm. uh, there is an opportunity to make the world a better place. Scott, thank you so much for your time. We're so grateful and thank you for all the good work you're doing. Well, I, I thank you for all your time and helping us. And guys, really, I really appreciate your help. And the fate of the oceans is in all of our hands. And if you're watching this, even a small donation will help get us out there so we can literally help stamp out this forest fire because it's ravaging the area. Thank, thank you, you, thank you.